This is our new model, which features the new hydroelastic suspension. This is the only car in its class with four-wheel disc brakes for twice the safety. This car is unique by virtue of its air-cooled engine. This fine example of Italian engineering offers you first-class finish, excellent performance, road holding and braking. The main feature is the rear opening window for, e for extra luggage space by pushing the back seat forward, which enables you to get a suitcase in very comfortably and very useful for mother's shopping. This uh, fully imported Japanese car is, we consider, the best value on the market today. Well, there we saw just a few of the shots being fired in this current small car war in Australia. A war which is just now reaching the peak of its intensity. A battle for customers, with the buyer's dilemma increasing with every new model produced. You know, it might be hard to believe, but there are no less than 44 different makes and models of small cars on the market today. By small cars, I mean cars of the 1500cc category and under, which also roughly means about a thousand pounds in price and under. And if you find that figure 44 still hard to believe, here's the complete list. These 44 vehicles are made by a total of 12 companies, which themselves represent a, a small United Nations. Australia, Great Britain, the United States, Germany, France, Italy, and Japan. So something of an international battle is now on for a share of a lucrative market which this year will amount to 130,000 new small cars on Australian roads, or 35% of the expected total new car market of 380,000 vehicles. Some models of small cars come into Australia fully assembled, ready to drive. More again are imported in pieces, as it were, and then put together using a minor percentage of Australian parts. While the greatest number are manufactured here, using a majority of locally made components varying from 60 to 90 percent. In Australia's big small car manufacturing plants, Volkswagen in Melbourne and the British Motor Corporation in Sydney, production is in the vicinity of 100 cars a day, or roughly one every five minutes. Mass production of cars is something Henry Ford invented 56 years ago, and which has now been developed to a peak of sophisticated automation with Australia's methods equal to the world's best. Australia's motor car business is less than 40 years old, yet vehicle manufacturing and service industries now employ one in 12 of the nation's workforce. The small car field, which has a price range from £575 to £999, is capturing an increasing share of the market every year. This year, small cars are expected to gain by more than 11% in a total passenger car market increase of only 2%. Only in the past few weeks we've seen two more new models enter the small car field, Hillman Imp and Morris 1100, and the competition well, stiffens. I, say, uh, I asked BMC's general sales manager, Arthur Grogan, if the war was being fought on a price or quality basis. We look at it uh, as being a combination of both. Our aim is to produce a vehicle which uh, is really value for money. This is the the whole concept of our policy is to provide a vehicle that represents value at a certain cost. So I would say it's a combination of both. Uh, this, once again, uh, on quality or price, uh, smaller manufacturers building overseas find this very difficult to match the quality of the Australian production, which uh, quite frankly is better in most cases an overseas production. We have a very, very high standard of quality from the automotive industry in general in Australia. All the same, it's the brilliance of overseas design engineers which has given today's small car its best ever prestige rating. High performance power units 
now come with a choice of front or rear placing, front or back wheel drive, air or water cooled engines, even east west engines, which face the driver at right angles. In fact, technical advances in small car engines are as significant in the automobile industry as transistors are in the business of radio and television. But John Williams of Melbourne, a motoring journalist for over 30 years, recalls only about a decade ago when small cars left much to be desired. Well, no small cars were very good then. I don't think we got, uh, we got any worse deal than anybody else, except that bodies were always made here for them locally completely, they were tacked on bodies, you know, mm. and uh, some of them were very cheap and nasty, and some of the body work, yeah. and they just fell to bits. Yes, I believe it wasn't too many years ago that the small car buyer was one who was thought to buy on the cheap, as it were, and his car would fall to bits after 100,000 miles or well before that. Oh, I think so, because you, really uh, the small car in those days wasn't a very pleasant thing to drive. <laughs> It was horribly rough and uh, very uh, cramped inside. Uh, all that's been so much improved. There's been more progress in small cars than in any other field, I think. Today's small cars seem to be fast developing into status symbols. Do you think so? Oh, well, yes. Well, there's no... Uh, nobody minds being seen in a small car now because they're... Uh, uh, they're extremely functional and they're handsome beautifully furnished, many of them. With 44 different small cars on a market where maximum price variation is only 400 pounds, selling has reached fever pitch. Right, gentlemen, now to summarise our lesson this morning on master salesmanship, we have our headings. M-A-S-T-E-R. Sales the staffs of all 12 companies involved have accelerated their campaigns and methods of buyer persuasion are now in top gear. And it looks magnificent. A, approach with benefits. When you come to your client, point out the benefits to him by owning this motor car. S, stimulate desire. There is a natural desire in all of us to own a motor car, but you must stimulate in this person the desire to own this motor car. Tell the facts. Tell the, the client all about the motor car, the facts of why he should have this motor car. Eliminate retirements. You'll always find there'll be some objection put up by the client. Well, you have enough information in your hands now to completely eliminate any of those points. And finally, ring up the sale. Get that order. So if you're thinking of buying a new car, you might be in for a bit of a shock when you step into that car showroom with the idea that you're going to be master of the situation. And talking of situations, how has this situation come about where the light car field is inundated with a wealth of vehicle variety? Well, this is one of the points I put to Dr. Neil Runcie, Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of New South Wales. I think the small car boom is more than a teenage fashion, although a visitor to Sydney's beaches at the weekend might form a somewhat contrary impression. But firstly, uh, we have a large number of motor vehicle manufacturers operating in Australia. I think they number some 14 in number, and we have some six fully-fledged uh, motor vehicle manufacturers. Now, this means that we have an intensely competitive market situation which has developed. Uh, I think that the development of the small car is not a distinctly Australian feature. In the United States, with multiple car ownership, the second choice has frequently been of a small car. And, of course, in Europe, with a uh, much greater concentration of populations in the cities, the small car has obvious advantages. But I think that the third point here is that the small car is meeting some real consumer needs. It's more economical to run, it uh, involves a small amount of capital outlay, and it's probably easier to arrange finance for a new small car than for an older vintage, vintage model. All the same, do you feel the nation's economy can sustain a sensible market for so many different types of vehicles? Well, even in the United States, where you have the big three major producers, uh, the consumer would have, I think, a choice of about 100 models from them. Now, in Australia, um, the main motor vehicle manufacturers have subcontracted to a significant extent. 
and this means where you have one part supplier supplying a number of manufacturers, he's able to achieve economies of scale. But there is a, an important point involved here. Australia is a small country. I think the successful establishment of a motor vehicle industry is a very considerable achievement in the post-war years. But in the next 15 to 20 years, I think we have to think beyond Australia to potential export markets. Although one of the latest model small cars has a new type of suspension that's said to float on fluid, all others still rely on conventional type springs and conventional type shock absorbers, which are subject to constant testing processes, along with some of the other hard-wearing parts of a small car. And at regular stages in production, complete engines are plucked out of the assembly line, mounted in a test bed, and run at low and high speeds non-stop for weeks on end to determine their durability. But the final proof is in the eating, or driving, and here on a test run is what today's small cars have to endure to survive in a rugged market. General Motors Holden's plant outside Melbourne is Australia's biggest car producer with 790 vehicles rolling off the line every day. 730 of these are sedans and station wagons in the bigger car range. In fact, GMH has only 6.6% of its entire production given over to small cars. Mr. Ben Kassam is the company's general sales manager. How then does the company regard the importance of the small car market in Australia? Well, of course, <clears throat> I think you have to examine the small car market a little bit to understand uh, the segment that it occupies in the overall market. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, the small car market, uh, as you call it, uh, is represents about 27% of the total market, roughly. Now, of course, and that market has been declining uh, since 1960. We don't anticipate it to, uh, that it will be a very much larger share of the overall market. We measure it perhaps a little bit differently than uh, some others in that we consider station sedans to be passenger vehicles. And in considering them to be passenger vehicles, it probably might uh, <coughs> distort the statistics a little bit as compared with the way some others might measure it. Does GMH consider the Viva to be something of a secret weapon in the small car war in Australia? Well, we hope that <clears throat> the Viva, when we announce it, and it will be uh, uh, later on, probably sometime before the middle of this year, we hope that it will be uh, very acceptable on the Australian market. Mr. Kassam, rumours are quite rife uh, in motoring circles around Australia that GMH are soon to produce a baby Holden. Is there any truth in this? No, no truth in it at all. We have no plans uh, for a baby Holden. Consumer spending on motor vehicles in Australia is almost two shillings out of every one pound, which, next to food and clothing, is the highest single item of personal expenditure. A recent survey of selected areas in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane shows about two out of three households have a motor car, while one out of eight of these have more than one vehicle. In fact, the increase in two-car families appears to be strongly influenced by the developing small car market, where the purchase of a new small car is often considered more economical than buying a larger second-hand one. At the same time, statistics show that about three out of five car owners in Australia never buy a new car, and that second-hand vehicles represent about 40% of the value of all vehicles sold. These figures show just how important the average Australian motorist regards resale values. And it's here the small car makers and distributors claim a distinct advantage. A lower initial cost, they say, means a lesser loss at the point of resale. 
President of the New South Wales Chamber of Automotive Industries, Mr. D.I. Donaldson, describes Australia as the neutral ground for this international battle between British, German, French, Italian, American and Japanese makers of small cars. Recently, Mr. McEwan made a public statement that Australian manufacturers were to progressively increase the local content in cars on the Australian market. All manufacturers have taken heed of this and have progressively increased their Australian content in cars that are being sold here. However, it is apparent from registration figures that it does not play a very important part of the country of origin. People are uh, guided mainly by economic conditions, their needs, etc., and buy a car irrespective of where, where it was originally conceived. Are there any exceptions to this? Yes, uh, in some rural areas we find that uh, certain uh, grazier types are inclined to uh, favour, shall we say, a Japanese car because Japan buys such a large quantity of wood, wool, but this is infinitesimal in the overall market. Despite 44 different models on the compressed small car market, manufacturers say market saturation is a long way off. But Australian Motoring Authority David Mackay has a different point of view. I would say that it's very much the same as it is in the United States. This is not restricted to the, to the cars up to 1,000 pounds, but is right through the industry. Uh, this is, of course, an excellent thing from the point of view of the public, but not such a very good thing from the industry, because they have now started to chop the prices of these cars, and that goes right the way through from the factory down to the distributor and the man that actually sells the car. Does this mean then that the car is being paired in expense with other and perhaps more important uh, components? Uh, well, that is hard to say, of course, uh, but we would say that it is. Uh, we feel that um, such things as the uh, paint, the interior trim, in some cases the tires, are uh, of uh, a second grade. I think you will find that uh, within the next season, cars up to £1,000 will become fewer. I don't think so, necessarily. I think it will depend very much on uh, whether a car is interesting, original, good performer. It'll always have some kind of a public in those cases, if it has a claim to individuality, because there are an awful lot of people they like to be individual, you know, they just don't, uh, they don't want to drive the same as everybody else. You know, Australia is fourth in the world for cars per head of population. A figure of one car for every 4.7 people. By 1970, the figure is expected to be 3.7. And also by 1970, almost half a million new cars are expected to be on the road in that year. Well, now, every city motorist knows what traffic congestion is like today. By 1970, even if all cars happen to be small cars, the traffic picture is a pretty frightening one to contemplate. But that's another story. <laughs>